The opening scenes of the Black Panther show a glowing blue meteorite landing in Africa before the dawn of civilization. Later, five tribes would come together, the narrator says, and call the land Wakanda. War was constant until the Black Panther goddess empowers a warrior shaman, making him the first Black Panther and protector of Wakanda. Wakanda develops advanced technology thanks to the vibranium only found in their secluded country, a seclusion that means neither the country nor the people suffered under colonial rule. Instead, they are free, creative, and inventive, having developed technology far more advanced than any other country has. Combining tribal imagery, myth, the mystical, science fiction, and fantasy, The Black Panther is one of the most recognizable works of Afrofuturism in film, creating a new world for the exploration of Black culture, identity, and more. Afrofuturism is a movement that crosses art, music, and literature, reimagining Blackness. Mark Derry first coined the term in his 1993 essay, Black to the Future. And writer Yatasha L. Womack says in Afrofuturism, the world of Black sci-fi and fantasy culture, that Afrofuturism is an intersection of imagination, technology, the future, and liberation that redefines culture and notions of Blackness for today and the future. Afrofuturism combines elements of science fiction, historical fiction, speculative fiction, fantasy, Afrocentricity and magic realism with non-Western beliefs. In some cases, it's a total re-envisioning of the past and speculation about the future, rife with cultural critiques. And then I'm going to pull up an image quick of one of the Black Panther comics. So you can see some of these different elements in the way that they're combined. Um, if you look at the background with the red stripes running through it, it has a very futuristic feel to it. And then you have sort of the magic myth mystery surrounding the Black Panther himself and his abilities and the myth with the Egyptian looking Sphinx statue that he's sitting on top of. Plus you get those tribal images with his claw necklace and in addition to the tribal, you get the technological. If you know anything about it, the necklace was created by his sister and it basically lets him put it on and shoop, there goes his whole suit. And then you have that reflection of Africa in there as well with the, um, with the Panthers themselves and the black lion, um, all of them conveying a sense of power and strength. All right, so, Beginning in the 1950s, we have sort of the origins loosely of Afrofuturism, at least in music. And those are attributed to jazz musician Sun Ra and also funk inventor George Clinton. Ra was born Herman Poole Blount in Birmingham, Alabama. And from an early age on, he sort of began his own personal exploration for black identity. And because of that search, he ended up changing his name um, to that of the Egyptian god. And he and his bandmates, the orchestra, um, also ended up claiming that they were from Saturn and that they were brought to Earth to heal and bring people together through music. Creating a new and clean persona let him more fully explore his ideas about Black culture, identity, and future. It was also at this time that he, along with his bandmates again, began experimenting musically. And since they were very theatrical, they also started dressing in full sci-fi space costumes. And that was something that Ra later adopted as his everyday normal walk down the street dress. Um, Adriano Alaya says that Ra's music was aimed at denouncing racial, racial discrimination by underlining the potential of marginalized Black people. And I'm gonna play you a little clip from one of his songs. Most of them are fairly lengthy. Um, so this will only be a small segment of the beginning of a work of his called Astro Black. Thank you. 
slow black mythology. Astro timeless immortality. All right. So I wanted to play you that little bit so you could kind of hear a little bit of the sounds. Um, and if you notice, the beginning is sort of a very sci-fi sort of sound, almost quiet. And then in comes the tribal. You have the hand-beaten drums rather than your typical jazz instruments, which come a few seconds later. And there you start to get the horns, um, snare drum, everything else. But the sounds aren't quite the same. You can kind of pick out the jazz, but they don't follow the same sounds or rhythms as you typically think of in jazz. And then finally, you get the lyrics, a little bit of the lyrics at the end, where you get that whole combination of elements again, with astro referring to space, black referring to race, and then the ideas about myth and mythology. Um, the second one who was very influential was George Clinton who like Ra wanted his music to take from and acknowledge black history. And because of the slave trade, it's missing past while also looking toward the future. Clinton himself said in the documentary, Last Angel of History, that the reason he developed the music and spaceship imagery was because I had to find another place where they hadn't perceived black people to be. And that was on a spaceship. So once again, there's that whole idea of placing Blacks in this future, in a different place, different time, and stripping them of the preconceived notions, the prejudices, the stereotypes, and basically starting fresh with a new identity. And the same thing as Sun Ra did with his costumes and his um, name change as well. So moving from jazz and funk to techno, hip hop, house and more, artists like Missy Elliott, Outkast, Erica Badu and Janelle Monet have developed Afrofuturist music in order to explore ideas about and images related to blackness. In literature, science fiction writers Octavia Butler and Samuel R. Delaney are credited as the early mother and father of Afrofuturist literature, but it's actually found in many of the early 1900 stories of Charles W. Chestnut and in W.E. Du Bois' 1920 short story, The Comet, which is a powerful example of early Afrofuturism and also a critique of racism. In The Comet, a comet hits New York City and only two people are left alive. The black man, Jim Davis, and the white woman, Julia. And they manage to find each other. They set aside all their differences, all their stereotypes, assumptions, and they start working together, building a new life, and then they find more white survivors. Born in Harlem in 1942, Samuel R. Delaney's writing explores ideas about race, class, and sexuality. When asked the question that Octavia Butler both posed and addressed, what good is science fiction to black people? Delaney said, science fiction isn't just thinking about the world out there. It's also thinking about how that world might be particularly important exercise for those who are oppressed, because if they're going to change the world we live in, they and all of us have to be able to think about a world that works differently. Octavia Butler is another influential and early Afrofuturist writer. Born in Pasadena, California in 1948, she said she decided to write science fiction at age 12 after she watched a science fiction movie and decided that she could write it a lot better. And she very much did. In exploring ideas about race, in, in addition to exploring ideas about race in her works, Butler also gives voice to black women. Her novels and stories centered around strong black female heroines who are not only survivors, but who also unify people and communities. In her autobiographical essay, Positive Obsession, Butler talks about being, along with Delaney, the only black science fiction writers early on. And the constant question at speaking engagements about what good is science fiction to black people. She answers the question by posing a series of questions. 
What good is science fiction's thinking about the present, the future, and the past? What good is its tendency to warn or to consider alternative ways of thinking and doing? What good is its examination of the possible effects of science and technology or social organization and political direction? And what good is all this to black people? Both Delaney and Butler paved the way for the current prolif proliferation of amazing Afrofuturist writers. From ta Coates, who has written not only novels and journalistic articles, but also a series of Black Panther comics from Marvel, to Victor Lavelle, whose works include the Destroyer comic series that rewrites Frankenstein and the novella The Ballad of Black Tom, to Nettie Okorafor, whose works blend myth, magic, science fiction, and fantasy, and who also wrote a Marvel series, Shuri, about the Black Black Panther's younger sister who must step up when he disappears. 